Dr. Mia uh, Mikik, uh, advisor at large of ArtNet uh, and visiting fellow, Institute of Euro Asia Study at Zagreb University. In fact, she was uh, uh, a former director of the Trade Investment Innovation Division at UNS for years. And uh, I could say that she also the founder uh, of ArtNet herself, very active network among uh, economists uh, in, in uh, Asia Pacific. So uh, you have the floor, uh, Mia Miki. Sorry, I'm unmuted now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Suripan. Uh, I'm not sure if my slides are visible, uh, if you can just nod or something. Uh, you can see clearly. You can see, you clearly. Can see clearly. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, a very good uh, mid-morning from, uh, from Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, and it is with uh, immense pleasure that I'm joining this event. Um, and first, I want to congratulate on the sessions yesterday and this morning. They were so insightful and interesting and very highly engaging in terms of uh, put, you know, bringing in uh, participants. So I hope uh, us economists uh, will, will manage to follow this, uh, this pattern. Uh, but I'm also, uh, you know, of course, grateful that I'm being invited to, to speak today, but also to see so many of the ArtNet associates um, uh, joining, joining the session. So thank you very much for, for giving me uh, this opportunity. Uh, yesterday and, and this morning uh, until now, we have been mostly sort of immersed into the discussions uh, led uh, by scholars uh, of political economy, political science, international uh, relations, etc. So I think now we are turning towards the uh, more of the more of the economic and trade issues. I hope it's not going to be very dry uh, for the for the participants. Uh, and I want to say at the outset that I'm you know coming from the trade side. Um, uh, I'm not going to be really dwelling into the uh, terminology and uh, formal sort of split between Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific, etc. Uh, I'm really talking about regional integration uh, from the sort of 30 <laughs> 30,000 feet uh, above and uh, and uh, for every large region like like this continent continent of Asia we will have different uh, sub-regional um, disparities and differences. So we are really looking at how do we pull the regions that are not integrated in the context of uh, regional economic activities in. And, um, and, and that's my uh, set of task today is really to look at the factors that have been brought to the surface, maybe uh, more so through the, through the COVID, even though they were lingering behind uh, the surface uh, before the COVID as well, and you know what, what to put, put attention uh, as we move on um, as a as a community of, of of researchers, applied researchers, and think tanks to help uh, with this with this process. Um, uh, of course, we we are you know we are working on our papers still, um, and uh, given the short period of time that we have for presentations. I will uh, just deal with a couple of slides that I have as a synopsis that uh, uh, that I'm using for the for for completion of the paper, and I'm not going to go into the rest of the presentation. Hopefully, it can be shared. Uh, uh, it has uh, over 20 slides. I don't want to uh, 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 get into the bad book of Suripan for crossing the time. So I'm just going to uh, narrate uh, some of these and uh, let you look at the empirical uh, sort of part uh, later uh, later on. Uh, in terms and, and you know, trade economists are always accused to be living in the past because we always have to rely on historical data for, for trade. So I can't but uh, start this with uh, some recent, recent, recent past. And this really goes to the state of uh, trade flows and other uh, uh, cross border uh, interactions uh, within uh, uh, Asia and between Asia and the rest of the world. 
uh, before the before the pandemic because a pandemic is really creating one sort of a breakpoint and we will be uh, I think in times to come dealing with pre-pandemic uh, and post-pandemic uh, situations. So uh, that's why we, we need to define what was happening before and then how the things we might be changing and why uh, afterwards. So of course, uh, before the pandemic, we, we were, uh, and in particular Asia, uh, was was still uh, in the in the uh, mode of not fully recovered uh, from the impact of the global uh, financial crisis, uh, so uh, which was mostly reflected in a sharp change between uh, in the in the relationship between trade and uh, GDP, so that elasticity of trade has actually come closer to one and stayed there. Uh, in the in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, and we have to be mindful of that as we move towards uh, the recovery out of uh, out of COVID. But that had implications on how uh, major uh, nodes of the factory of Asia were responding to the notion of you know um, building their development strategy based on external demand, uh, since uh, this had uh, now. Uh, impact on how it fits, uh, fits uh, how this demand can be actually fed into into future growth. And then on top of that, of course, we had um, we had trade war that started uh, in 2017, and then it had you know uh, different different cycles, etc. Uh, that did impact the the state of intra Asian trade, uh, which. Um, uh, reach the level uh, of uh, uh, you know more than fifty percent some time ago, and uh, only uh, only last year actually it 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 grew quite you know for a couple of or three points uh, simply because it, this was the trade uh, where uh, we had the expansion. Uh, but the the matter of uh, you know the the truth is that uh, intra Asian trade has been driven with small number of countries and uh, really the, the the exchange of parts and components intermediate trade I think uh, Professor uh, 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 Kimura uh, has has shown that with this uh, slide on the on the intra intra industry trade in, in machinery as well so uh, the countries that are not able to actually uh, engage in that were excluded from this notion of factory of Asia and were not part of this booming um, intra-Asian uh, trade and then of course uh, everything else that comes with it uh, foreign direct investment and the building of the IPNs or the or the value chains etc. Um, the uh, uh, for you know, for a long time we have uh, we have tried to see how we can support uh, expansion of trade through the through the bilateral or regional trade agreements. And Asia is no different. Actually, Asia became leader in putting in place uh, free trade agreements uh, in terms of their number. Even though the maybe the impact is not always what it was. Uh, it was. Uh, planned uh, to, to reach so. And when you look at the spread, I have a, a very nice graph, I'm not showing those, uh, the spread of the, uh, the uh, FTAs across the region, then you will see that uh, they, they are very patchy throughout uh, Asia and they cover uh, well sub-regions. So we have, of course, ASEAN covered, we have Pacific covered, we have uh, Central Asia covered, even though the agreements are not as, as effective, we have even South Asia covered, but there are uh, only few in between those sub regions and in particular they lack in existence between South Asia and, uh, for example, Pacific or Central Asia, uh, they exist uh, in a, in a patchy way again. Uh, between Southeast Asia and South Asia, but definitely not to the level that um, that they exist in this uh, silos uh, sub-regional effect. So in terms of their number and cover and, and the depthness, uh, they really were not um, in, um, in the function of increasing um, 
increasing uh, region-wide inter integration through trade, investment, technology movements, etc. Uh, there are, of course, other issues, but I'm looking also at my at my um, watch here, and I really have to speed up. So, pandemic then uh, actually brought uh, uh, to the surface so many weaknesses that uh, that were built in the way of uh, of cooperation between the countries, not only in Asia, but in particular between Asia, factory factory Asia, and the rest of the world. Uh, but also actually showed what are the opportunities that can be used. And uh, uh, I, I, last year already, but in this, this year, first quarter at least, uh, that we can relay uh, to the data that we have, uh, shows actually recovery in terms of the flows, uh, not so much in investment, but definitely in uh, merchandise trade. Of course, services trade has been hammered down and in particular, the conventional services that require people to people connectivity, uh, like uh, like tourism, et cetera, but digital um, uh, services uh, have been, um, have been uh, growing even though they are more localized and uh, still not because of the difficulties in, in terms of the uh, financial movements uh, across the borders, um, they, they cannot be easily, uh, easily um, exploited uh, for furthering uh, regional, regional integration as yet. Right? Uh, however, we do have this lingering sort of impact of uh, what uh, what uh, of of protectionism? Let me put it uh, that way. And it's not only protectionism across the you know at the border. It's not only having tariffs. And actually, there are few few tariffs uh, that have been uh, worked with uh, during the pandemic. But we do have different type of protectionism that is sitting at the uh, or being built in into business models and as well into new. Uh, type of the industrial policies that uh, that uh, is uh, actually using uh, quite a bit of government intervention of the of the new type uh, and in one way it is welcome because uh, we have to be prepared on new shocks but uh, but it may actually uh, cause uh, a concern for uh, a, a more, more of a sticky interventions of the governments in that that may be then preventing um, preventing new uh, new ventures uh, that that can be used um, I'm, I'm going now in my second uh, uh, second slide um, so with the challenges that for the past pandemic integration uh, I have put some here they are not all of them but I tried to really focus more on the on, on the trade and investment activities and the movement of people knowledge technology. So uh, starting with uneven recovery, because the demand will be the one that will be pulling uh, a, a trade flows as well and integration uh, is, uh, you know, IMF uh, continuously uh, provides new updates on that and we still have very uneven picture in, in that. We have, as it was, uh, as it was uh, already said, uh, movements in terms of decoupling of the economies uh, that are driven by geo politics uh, and uh, are not driven only by the US, they are driven from inside Asia, we can talk about that as well, um, as well in the, in, the, in the questions that are driven by China in terms of technology as well, and particularly in, in terms of the financial integration, we are all witnessing what is happening with the uh, with the uh, attempts of the various companies uh, to actually engage uh, with the stock exchanges um, uh, overseas. Uh, so there are many different ways of decoupling that is happening and that may be really uh, not only sand in the <laughs> in the wheels of integration, but really a serious serious obstacle. And then we have, of course, the the the, the focus of reshoring that is more of a business type of uh, impact, and uh, that is really link, linked to the to the uh, to to need of businesses to really look seriously about risks and that spells as higher trade costs. So there will be different calculations made and uh, definitely that may mean that parts of the production that has been 
done in Asia for the rest of the world. They'll be moving somewhat within Asia, but definitely uh, some of it will uh, actually leave Asia as well. Uh, there are many obstacles that are being put uh, through these new industrial policies, but also through more, um, you know, conservative uh, conservative border policies on the movement of capital, FDI, people, data, and technology, and that definitely will uh, uh, will uh, will be an obstacle to further uh, integration. There is uh, we normally relied on uh, on multilateral trade regime to provide the glue for you know cementing low trade costs at, at, etc. Uh, although there are some positive news from Geneva, we are still facing uh, sort of a, a, a break in, in that global system. And if we really start relying only on the plurilateral uh, systems, that will be something that one may use the term balkanization of global trade system, which again, uh, uh, may not be uh, in interest of some of the developing countries uh, in, in the region. Um, in the in the advanced countries that are actually that have been the major destination uh, of uh, trade products of uh, of Asia, um, uh, there is a wavering uh, support to globalization, uh, and that is uh, the, the very clear uh, in U.S. Uh, in Europe. Uh, but even in in Australia and New Zealand, I have to say, uh, and uh, I'm sure that it is also there even within within Asia. And so governments, of course, that uh, you know that are democracies and have to play to the electorates in in their countries, have to also take that into account as they uh, move on. Um, I have uh, only two more points to go to, so I will go very quickly. The other uh, the other big problem is uh, is an enormous amount of distrust between governments. Um, I have until recently worked uh, for the United Nations. I have been dealing with governments, organization of the meetings, etc. And uh, I'm privy of understanding how deep uh, this uh, mistrust is. Um, and uh, and also the lack of willingness really to uh, to to look at trade and economic uh, cross-border activities as a positive sum game. It is still very much seen as a competition uh, and a zero sum game. And so this of course is very clear through the vaccination issues that, that we are all uh, very much um, witnessing, but uh, also in the proposals that we were putting on to the governments to really look at uh, finding uh, sort of a, a joint positions or moving from uh, market access uh, negotiations to actually uh, rules and standard negotiations and to support uh, the regional regional positions uh, that would uh, enhance actually a viability of the multilateral one uh, that never went and that never got any any traction um, and and so uh, you know. I, th I think uh, for this region as well, we may be we may be looking at uh, at one of the reasons of why we are facing these problems with uh, deepening of the regional integration uh, in the in the obvious lack of the one strong regional institution that can push together for political and uh, economic interests. Of course, this is uh, very difficult uh, given the vastness of the region, but still um, uh, there is uh, there, there is obvious lack bet between these. Um, uh, I have some interesting slides that talk about competing uh, regional initiatives. I don't have time to actually go uh, into, into these. And so let me just uh, end with a couple of points of uh, what I think us as think tanks should be doing. And obviously uh, the policies that we can, uh, or the advices that we, we can provide to the policymakers need to be uh, based on evidence and applied research. We have no data to be up to, uh, you know, to be up to date and to provide uh, provides uh, high quality information for these policies. Uh, we need, you know, higher frequency data and we need uh, to do, uh, 
to encourage governments to actually provide more uh, more investments into compilation of of data so that we can work with those and provide better better support and and then we have to work in really providing uh, enough of in high quality information so that everyone is interested in being transparent um, because it would be based on facts rather than the um, misinformation or uh, or half half-baked information um, so what i think is really uh is really important for the region is to, for policymakers and other stakeholders to really uh get ready to uh, to absorb in this process of integration several uh several larger shifts uh, one is definitely shift from uh, uh, industrial manufactured commodity trade will stay as it has to, but uh, those others that can be actually done uh, in a localized way using technology uh, will be will be going away, and so we will be doing much more of the knowledge based data based uh, trade as well as. Uh, uh, high skilled uh, labor services, uh, professional services using uh, using platform and using digitized um, uh, processes, uh, not only to facilitate trade, but also to do uh, production and, and other things. Uh, interventions will be definitely, uh, uh, you know, we all know about national security, etc. So interventions will be coming from the technology content of all these as well as processes in terms of say human rights and and other things that um, that europe for example is looking more specifically uh regulation will be moving definitely behind the border uh we have seen the uh, advance in terms of tax uh, uh policies etc but also in terms of data and regulation on uh on standards and competition for standard setting that is now clearly between Asia and uh, some other entities in the in the world, and then of course uh, deep uh, widening, broadening, softening, if you wish, of trade policies uh, by uh, by building in non trade objectives you know you can talk about gender you can talk about uh, environment you can talk about uh, foreign policies aid etc uh, protection of uh, of uh, indigenous uh, people etc these are all now being uh, built into the trade policies and so the integration now is not based only uh, in terms of seeking market uh, market access but it is actually um, built on uh, on bringing in uh, these high level or broader uh, objectives into uh, the cooperation with with other countries so thank you very much uh, for uh, for uh, letting me go over time uh, and uh, uh, you know I, I hope people can uh, look at the slides at, in um, in the, in their own time and uh, of course at the at the paper later on I'll stop share now and thanks a lot Suripan. Thanks a lot, uh, Miamiki, for uh, your presentation. Very stimulating. In fact, uh, with all uh, the points and issues that you raised, I'm sure that we will come back more uh, for the discussion. What uh, you just shown us, I'm sure that's how uh, complicated it is now that we will be moving into. Uh, already before the, the COVID, we had quite a, a kind of disruption from, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you're talking about the, uh, the trade war and uh, the kind of uh, decoupling, reshoring, and uh, it uh, is in couple with the digitalization we have all, all along. And now in the post COVID, uh, 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 dilemma we have uh, and the challenges that you just raised so uh, many challenges. I agree very much about the uh, the kind of recommendation for for all of us for think tank that we should uh, continue to pursue. Uh, you know very much uh, evidence based research that we have all done because it not will not be easy because if we did the data information and. Uh, and we maybe try to compare even uh, kind of that. And I'm sure that we need to have that kind of session uh, more to, to talk about it. And that would make it clear 
about the future direction of uh, Asian integration, if you might like to say, and the kind of support from policymakers that they need to take into account uh, for all this. So, uh, 